And um, now we're talking about space. Do you think there's space? There's life in space? There somewhere? has to be. There has I mean, to be somewhere, right? Well, it would just be so damn disappointing if there wasn't. Yeah, and then. And who do we think we are that we're the only ones alive exactly. in the entire universe? Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. I mean, are we the best the universe has to offer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This are can't be the best. Can't be right. This can't be the best conversation out there that for sure. That cannot uh-huh. be right. No. Some other planet's doing Fox Twenty talks right, right now, and they're right. twenty times better right. than us. Yeah, the third, the third. They don't level. even have to talk. Yeah, they, yeah, just, they don't. The thoughts pass just, across yeah. into the other yeah. brain. Well, we have a, a brain talking to us right now, Kevin Wagner, for U of A astronomer. Kevin, thanks for chatting with us today. I got the chance to talk to you earlier, and um, I have to say, Kevin, your background like is exactly what, what I would have wanted, be, right? Yeah, in this. So he looks. Thank you for that. He, he yeah, walks the talk, yeah sure. And it's the... just my office. Perfect. Exactly. He fitting. talks the talk and walks the walk and right. has the office all the. So, Kevin, we were talking earlier today, uh, me and you, about. Um, so you and others have found what could – well, you talk me through this, but if there's any hope that we find a planet or moon or something with life on it, we may have found an area where that could happen. Did I set it up sort of right? No, yeah. you probably did not <laughs> at all. <laughs> Kevin, help me out. Take it from – Almost there. exactly and close enough. So okay. what we have is a candidate giant planet in the habitable zone of the closest star – of the closest stellar system, which is actually a system of three stars. Um, Two of them are approximately sun-like, and around one of them is the one that we've found this planet candidate around. And and how close is the star system? We're talking about Alpha Centauri, right? Right. It's about four light years away. Okay, so... Which in space terms is just like, hey, go right around the corner, hang a left, and you're there. Yeah, yeah. Right next door. Kevin, how how long would it take to get there with a conventional rocket? Um, if we could get to about say ten percent the speed of light, forty years. Wow. Okay, that's you doable. Trenton. Yeah, you got you yeah. got. It's my retirement plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fox in space, right? Uh, now, how did we see this, Kevin, and why do we think this stands out? So we first saw this as a candidate detection with a ground-based telescope in 2019, when we took this telescope and we pointed it at Alpha Centauri for as long as we were allowed to. Um, which was about a month. Um, So we saw a point of light. It was consistent with being a planet, but it was also consistent with being other things. Um, It could have been circumstellar dust. Our own um, sun has dust in the orbit of the Earth. This is called the zodiacal light. It's due to collisions of asteroids and ejecta from comets and things like that. So this could have been dust around Alpha Centauri. It also could have just been some new noise artifact. This was the first observation of its type. We had never pointed the biggest telescope on Earth at the brightest, one of the brightest stars in the sky for a month on end. And we let that possibility open in our assessment as well. So more recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has looked at the same star at Alpha Centauri A and has seen a point of light with about the same brightness, but now it's on the other side of the star. So what that looks like is, well, first of all, it doesn't look like circumstellar dust is a possibility anymore because that would tend to stay in the same place. Whereas now we see a point of light on the other side of the star that's clearly a point of light, not a disk, and um, that's consistent with an orbit. Now that doesn't confirm that this is a planet. It's possible to fit an orbit through pretty much any two points, but what it gives us is, well, one, a very exciting candidate, but it also gives us a very strong prediction for confirming that candidate as an actual planet. With those two points separated in time and on opposite sides of the star, we can create orbital models or we can ask what orbits are consistent with the detections and then make a very strong prediction for where that planet should be in the future. And when we observe it again, if we see it there, then that'll be rock solid confirmation. Kevin, I got to ask you. So you you eat, breathe, sleep, space. That that is your territory. So, fair statement. Yeah. So <laughs> as you're making these observations, and I, I know that you know you you also outside of this have have thoughts, have an imagination. What what do you think life could look like out there as as you're making these observations? Well, it's a really fascinating question. Um, Of course, we're used to thinking about life like we know it on our own Earth, on a rocky planet in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. But take a minute to think about 
the Jovian system, about the system of moons around Jupiter. There are several bodies there, um, Europa, Ganymede, um, Callisto, that are icy, that are rocky, that have radii, that aren't too dissimilar from the Earth, um, up to about a quarter of the Earth's radii for some of the biggest moons in the solar system. So if we were to take Jupiter and put it where the Earth is, then we would be talking about not one, but possibly three or more bodies that would likely have liquid water on their surface and that could possibly be habitable. So if we talk about habitable environments in the universe, there might be a larger number of habitable moons than habitable planets. That's not something that I can say with confidence, but that's a conjecture that is at least possible. Wow. And that, sorry, that's the point I wanted to, uh -huh. to bring up is that, uh, Kevin, it's not necessarily that this planet may harbor life if it is a planet after all, but you think that might be a gas giant and the moons around it might make more sense because they might be rocky and might hold air or oxygen, water, that kind of thing, suitable for life. Is that close? Right. So the planet candidate itself would be necessarily more massive than a rocky planet. Um, we have a pretty good measurement of the radius of the planet. What we really measure in the images is brightness. And then that brightness corresponds to a radius combined with a temperature. We know the temperature pretty well from the separation from the star. So really that leaves us with a measurement of radius. And it's about the radius of Jupiter or Saturn, which are both pretty similar in terms of their physical size. They're a bit difference in mass. Um, so what we're looking at is something that's probably close to the mass of Saturn and um, similar in radius to Jupiter and Saturn. So not rocky, but Jupiter has a rich system of moons. Saturn has a rich system of moons. Every planet in our solar system outside of the orbit of Venus is orbited by at least one moon. So the expectation is that, well, my expectation anyways, is that every giant planet likely has um, at least one, probably several moons. Kevin, I wanted to ask too, you, you know, uh, we, we spoke to Avi Loeb uh, not too long ago about uh, three I Atlas, that interstellar object uh, that's mm -hmm. that's coming through right now, and uh, you know Avi had some uh, interesting perspective uh, before even we had the data that we have now on what it could be and possibilities uh, for life. But uh, one one thing I I thought was interesting was just the conversation uh, that we're having where he makes it a point to say. Uh, you know, we shouldn't put limitations on what we talk about, and especially even in the scientific community about that. And do you do you feel like uh, there's kind of been, I guess, a, a a thawing of that, at least in the larger public discussion, but even the scientific community about what could be out there and uh, what what secrets might be out that we need to talk about? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, the universe tends to be even crazier than we can imagine in lots of cases. Um, for Comet 3 Atlas in particular, um, I think we can say with some certainty now this isn't a miles long uh, <laughs> rocky body. This is actually more of a comet. We see yeah. the coma, we see the tail, we see the emission from the comma. Um, so not so just one solid body in this case, but what's really fascinating about this and about really these, so it's three atlas for um, the third interstellar object or comet that's been discovered, third interstellar object. Um, the first one was more like an asteroid. It didn't have much um, volatile content or outgassing that we could see, but the next two were both comets. So we have visitors. Now they, in my opinion, probably aren't alive. They probably aren't um, actual aliens visiting us, but they are alien comets. They're pieces of another solar system that have been ejected from their own star and are now not orbiting our star, but they're within our solar system and will be on their way out on their um, hyperbolic trajectories before too long. But in the process, we see material leaving the comet and that material becomes part of our own solar system. So solar systems aren't just um, disjoint things in the universe, they exchange material. And that's what's most fascinating about 3i Atlas to me. And Kevin, you brought up another interesting thing about us traveling to Alpha Centauri or that uh, we hope we think planet out there that that maybe in the decades to come is 
feasible with some sort of robotic spacecraft? Can you talk me through that? Yeah, so there was um, a project that was envisioned called Project Starshot. And um, maybe interesting in this context also is that the observation that first found this planet candidate around Alpha Centauri uh, was part of the Breakthrough Watch program. So the Breakthrough Initiatives are really focused on um, privately funding what we can do in exoplanet science. And another one of these initiatives was Project Starshot, which is one of my favorite crazy ideas. And the idea is that you have several gram scale um, spacecraft with just a very simple imaging system and a light sail and a communication system. And that's it. And then you launch these in low Earth orbit and you accelerate them with giant lasers on the surface of the Earth using the momentum that's exchanged when the photon hits the sail. And you just use these very powerful lasers to accelerate these very small spacecraft to a fraction of the speed of light. Um, and then you can get there just in, like we talked about, a number of decades. And then the light comes back in just a matter of years. Finally, we get to use some lasers around here. It's awesome. And they're taking us places. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Kevin, too, uh, just want to ask real quick before we go. Um, what what uh, what are you most excited about with uh, the James Webb Telescope and 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 what we could be finding soon out there in the heavens? There was a lot of hype about behind it. Um, I'm sure that it will continue to ex to surprise me. And what I am thinking about is the most exciting thing that I'll learn from JWST is probably not the most exciting thing that I'm going to learn from JWST. But right now, I'm really fascinated in knowing if this planet candidate is actually real or not. And like I said, we have a very strong prediction for where the planet should be. Um, in about a year from now, it should be perfectly well observable. And I'm excited to get back um, on the source and see if there's still a planet yeah. there. Um, beyond that, yeah, I think that the most fascinating thing about this generally is whether this has moons and how we can find those moons. Um, and we might need a new space telescope for that, but um, we have some ideas there as well. And maybe one day life. Kevin Wagner, astronomer, U of A. Good stuff, Kevin. Appreciate, Appreciate your, time. your insight. Uh, yeah. Keep us posted. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. It's been Ready fun. for the mothership. Ready? Well, I, he says uh, he says those are not aliens coming to visit us. I know. I'm, I'm disappointed. disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I thought they were going to do when they got here. Probably yeah. not, not nothing good. Probably wouldn't have been good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Hang with us. Fox 10 Talks. We got Brian K next. Brian K, my man.